All right, what's up, YouTube? It's your main man, AB the Hero, back again with another video. And this is going to be a quick video. We're going to talk about this Rich Paul rule. I'm going to give you my insights and uh, break down to you why I think that the NCAA is putting this rule in place. And I'm going to give you some information on why I think that it is a shot at maybe Rich Paul, but not in the way that a lot of folks think. Let's go. So first off, in order to really talk about this Rich Paul rule, you got to have some understanding of who Rich Paul is. Rich Paul, point blank period, super agent, clutch sports, one of the great friends of LeBron James, a dude who got it out the mud, pulled himself up by his bootstraps, and really leveraged a lot of his relationships to get to the place that he is today. Next, you also have to understand where we are right now in the culture of basketball and some of the things that have happened um, over the past couple of years. The NCAA for a long time has been like, yo, we're not changing the rules. Amateurism is amateurism. We must protect the integrity of that. And in the recent years, what I would deem to be LeVar Ball effect, we've seen them start to tweak rules here and there. One of the big tweaks that they made recently was before, if you were a prospect and you were trying to test the waters to see if you had some... Uh, some some fish out there biting in the NBA, you could enter the NBA draft, but then you could pull out if you didn't necessarily get picked up in the spot that you wanted, right? So, but, and then you could go back and continue to play college basketball. The key to that was is you could not hire an agent. Now, the NCAA change recently was, okay, okay, you can test the waters in the NCAA in the draft, and you can hire an agent if you are an elite caliber of player. So a few of y'all can do it, all right? Now the rules have changed again and they're saying, you know what? You can hire an agent, you can test the waters, but the agent needs to be in our, needs to be certified by the NCAA. Here's where which Rich Paul rules come into play because the NCAA has created a criteria for said rules to, um, for, created a criteria for agents to comply with. Here's the basics here. Bachelor's degree, certified for minimum of three years, and you have to take an in-person exam at the NCAA office. Now, in-person exam at the NCAA office to me feels like a slight, like, yo, come on, my guy. Like, we, we going to, we going to let you feel what it's like to be an athlete. Same way you got to go show up, take that SAT, ACT, show your, um, your ID. You're going to listen to us. You want to get this, uh, you want to get... In contact with these type of players you're gonna have to do what we say here so I feel like that's where it comes from minimum of three years there's been some issues with that because there are already players who tested the water last year who have an agent who maybe not have the minimum of three years and then they're putting some kind of caveats in place so you could still represent guys and be kind of grandfathered in but the first one here bachelor's degree this is where it affects Rich Paul directly because like I said he's a guy who took the non-traditional approach to be the super agent that he is today and he does not have that bachelor's degree. Just a ton of real world experience. And as you know, sometimes college and real world experience are at odds with each other. So here's that example of that. So for me, I believe that this Rich Paul rule, while it does seem like a shot at Rich Paul, really is not in this point of time because it um if if you are testing the waters and you're trying to figure out whether or not your stock is is high enough to go to the NBA, then you're probably not a cl a player who Rich Paul is interested in signing because like I said, he's a super agent in regards. But what I will say is that I believe that this is a proactive approach from the NCAA and not a reactive approach, right? And as I told you before, we've seen them roll out some rules and start to tweak this. I believe that this is another tweak in the rules to kind of get us to a point that will be a significant change down the line here in a little bit. And I believe that this starts with this, the NBA's um, eligibility, requirement the requirements to be eligible for the NBA draft right now you have to be at least 19 years old and then also one year removed from the year that you graduated out of high school this was not always the case obviously 
Um, back in 2005 is when they created this rule, but you had players like Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, and a, a slew of other guys who, um, since 1995, who have been going straight from high school to the pros. The crazy thing is when you go down this list, a lot of these guys who have been able to make that jump from high school to the pros have actually had a decent NBA career. If you go all the way down here to 2005 and look at the last player selected in that 2005 draft, Amir Johnson, Andre Blatch, Lou Williams. We don't even really have to talk about Lou Williams. Six men of the year multiple times. But And so we, these guys have had pretty good careers. Amir Johnson... Um, a guy who's been playing in the NBA since 2005 and was in the NBA uh, last season as well. Uh, you got Andre Blatch, a guy who played a few seasons in the NBA, came back, played with the Brooklyn Nets, played some pro ball overseas. Um, let's look at Martell Webster, a guy, and some of these Martell Webster is a dude who I honestly I don't even know his name per se. But if you look, has had a a pretty long NBA career, first team parade All American, and these were some of the last guys who made the jump from high school into the NBA. Now, what I'll say here is this, right? To me, the NBA's one and done rule created a culture shift in basketball, right? When you go back and you start to look at the research of why the NBA felt like they wanted to create this one and done rule, it is has implications on like trying to deter urban America from trying to chase the basketball dream and change finances. This is almost damn near a direct quote from David, not, who's the, David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA at that time, not um Silver is the guy now. But David Stern, if you go look it up, and, and a lot of people at the time felt like these one and done rules and a lot of the barriers that are put on sports that are um, populated by predominantly African-American athletes kind of seem a bit like um, prejudice or whatever the word. I don't want to say racist. I don't want to get y'all a lot of y'all tootsies right now. But you know what I'm saying. So, um, so... That those are the things that that kind of started, but when you go way back, there was a lawsuit back in like the '60s, and the first couple of guys who ended up being able to leave college early, not even just go from high school, but to leave college early without graduating, you end up having to have a hardship clause. So it was crazy for in 2005 for the NBA to say, you know what? We having too many guys from the urban community who are trying to change their financial um, legacy of their families and, and just chasing this basketball dream in the NBA that we have to put this rule in place and give us an opportunity to like, you know what I'm saying, evaluate players further and college and all of that stuff. So even then, there was an agreement between basically the NCAA and uh, also the NBA to kind of put that rule in place. But what we've seen is that since that rule has been in place, things have begun to backfire a bit because what they were hoping to do is require guys to end it up end up going to college. Maybe you play for a couple years. The top ones end up playing for that one year and then going into the NBA. But what we've seen is that the climate now is that basically if you're coming out of high school and you're a top 20, top ESPN 100, the goal for you is to go to college one year, ball out, and then um, make the jump to the NBA. Whereas before, most guys who ended up going to college was doing it to prove that they were NBA ready, to build up a draft stock. And now it's being looked at as just like a, a, a placeholder. I'm going to the league anyway, especially if you're a top 10 player, you feel like I'm going to the league anyway. It's about this one year. And we're seeing that because... We're seeing that come into existence, and this is where folks like Rich Paul come into play. When you have guys like Darius Baisley or Mitchell Robinson, Darius Baisley, a guy who not only who who didn't even go to college, decided that you know what, 
I'm not even going to go to another team and play. I'm going to take the year off and I'm going to go do an internship. Um, Mitchell Robinson, the same thing. He didn't even do an internship or do anything to get money. He just went and trained for a year. So we, we see guys like that making the, um, the jump. Also, when you look at um, other instances where guys like a Kyrie Irving, who actually ended up going to college, played a couple games, got hurt, and said, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to just wait. So it's even more to the point where, for one, most players feel like at this point, we don't even need to play basketball, period, because our stock is set at a point where we're going to be NBA ready anyway. And then you got other guys who take the shot to go to college, um, like a Michael Porter Jr., maybe get injured and don't think that even that I'm hurt doesn't affect my draft stock enough that I'm going to come back and then kind of redeem myself another year in college. Um, you see those guys end up taking the um, going pro regardless. So what I feel like we're seeing from the NBA and the NCAA with this rule is that while the run and done rule is an NBA rule, and that's a big misconception. A lot of people give the NCAA credit for having that rule. It's actually an NBA rule. I think that we see that the tide is starting to turn. We've seen Commissioner Adam Silver talk about um, the development of um, basketball, G League, and other like avenues to develop players outside of the NCAA. We see them talk about how the one and done rule isn't being as effective as it as it um as it was intended to be. You see programs like Duke who were initially extremely against just having guys come there for one year. When you think about their illustrious history of having guys be there for a couple of years, Grant Hills and Christian Leitners, then end up just saying, you know what, if you can't beat them, join them, and signing all of these players with the intention of, I know you're only gonna be here one year, but the championship is bigger than like you chasing that, um, that degree at the end of the day. So we're seeing that shift in development of basketball throughout the NCAA, and I mean throughout the, the nation, and I feel like this Rich Paul rule, this is where it actually comes into play, is because this is not a rule that I believe is put into place to affect the current climate of basketball, but the climate moving forward. Because what is going to happen in the next couple of years is the NBA is going to get rid of the one and done rule, right? So right now, when you look at the, the wording inside this new criteria from the NCAA, it says current student athletes who are prospects to go to the NBA. And I think what you'll see the shift be is this rule even affecting players who are not even in the NBA. So high school prospects, because that will be the point where it'll be very important for you to decide, am I going to try to enter the draft, be a go from high school to pros, or do I actually need a year in college in order for me to, to make it to the NBA? Do I gotta show up and show out in college or the G League or something like that? So you having a an agent who fits the criteria for the NCAA, which I believe how they're going to tweak it in the future to say, you need the agent who has a bachelor's degree, who has been um, part of the MBPA for three years, and also has come to NCAA Indianapolis and taken this exam before you can uh, be a be eligible to enter the draft and then still be eligible to come to the NCAA. And I think that that'll matter because with high school prospects, the timing of when you are determined to be, okay, you're an NBA prospect, while it's players are getting more notoriety earlier and earlier, like it may not be until after your senior year where you are like, the scouts are like, yo, you ready? You, you may have a shot or you may come onto the scene. You may have a stellar senior junior year and then all of a sudden it's like, yo, you got a shot at this. So if you and your representation aren't planning ahead, then you'll either end up with an agent that has been handpicked and, and fed to you by the NCAA or you won't end up or you'll 
or you'll end up caught in a space where you'll be ineligible. And what we're seeing now with the culture of basketball, when you look at, like I said, the BBB and the big baller brand and folks like Rich Paul is sometimes folks are starting to go with agents in the Kawhi Leonard who Uncle Dennis and everything is in our own camp. When Lonzo Ball came to the NBA, his agent, Harrison Gaines, Lonzo was his first client. In this current setup, you're going to have some have to have some things put in place ahead of time. So, and then this also affects a guy like Rich Paul because while right now it is above him to like have a player who needs to test the waters, but when you're looking at high school prospects, then it'll you'll need to be somebody who is able to kind of put a plant a seed in the ear of some of these players who may need to test the waters a little bit. And then also be able to put a seat and and lock them up if they are deciding to test the waters and then end up going to college and then end up balling and then have are ready to go to the draft and you miss them because you are not eligible to talk to them when they were in high school. So so I, I think that that's how this will affect guys like um, Rich Paul and and other players who are trying to kind of build their own teams from within like you won't have the time to have your dad become certified or your mom be your agent or your uncle or your cousin in law school and all of this stuff if they haven't been acting as an agent for the past three years then like it wouldn't be in your best interest to work with them as you're transitioning from a prospect to a pro and one of the things that I will say is that I believe that this is something that it's not just an NCAA thing. This is something that I believe also a it's there's a lot of folks involved in this. If you think about this being a Rich Paul rule, then what you see is that there's a few different entities and agencies who are not extremely happy with the way my dog Rich Paul is handling business. When you look at what happened, like I said, with Darius Baisley going to um, New Balance, kind of setting a new trend and path, that is something that gets in the way of the G League, who has their G League program, and they created the program to try to get top talent who didn't want to go to college. And he's saying, you know what, don't even go to the G League. So that gives some incentive for the NBA and the G League to be kind of upset at you. When you're saying, don't even go to college, take this route over here, you already got the NCAA doing that. Now, when you then operating and moving around in the NBA, and you got other agents and all of this stuff upset at you because you're doing stuff against the green that ain't been done before, and the precedent is set that it's time to change the culture, you see that you got a lot of folks who will be upset with you. And since this Rich Paul rule thing came out, you see the NCAA released another statement trying to clarify or add some um, understanding to their requirements here. And they, like always, you know what I'm saying, they, they try to give you the same kind of talk about the focus on higher education and how you know, they just want you to have an agent who upholds the same standards that they want. But as we see, and as I mentioned earlier, the NCAA has definitely adapted to the model of, oh, okay, whatever, man, just give us a Zion for one year. We'll make as much money as we can and we'll, and we'll let him go ahead and go. So we see that the, the ideal of higher education is important to them, but it's all about the dollar on the other end. And then when you look at them and they talk about how they were able to come up this route with this rule, it wasn't just them. They consulted with a few different other agencies. And like I said, folks at Clutch Sports and Rich Paul have definitely pissed off a lot of people in this uh, field. So I think that there's a lot going on with this story, man. And uh, I don't think that this is the last time we'll see the NCAA tweak their criteria and their rules in the next couple of years I wouldn't be surprised if they continue to roll out this plan and if you know if you know you know going back to last year when the USA basketball the NBA and NCAA and all of them started having meetings around the time the JBA got started um, I believe that they probably 
put an action plan in place and we'll continue to see rules change in the NBA and rules change in the NCAA that definitely go hand in hand and work together seamlessly. And uh, like I said, man, it's your main man, AB the Hero. Uh, y'all been tuned in for a minute. Make sure y'all hit the like button. Show me some love, man. Let's get to 100 likes on this video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to get my YouTube on. And uh, like I said, it's your main man, AB the Hero. I'm out. Peace.